So anyway, a very warm welcome to you all this evening. I, I'm delighted that you're here. And I'm especially delighted uh, that this evening we've got Dr. Mike Hodder with us, who's going to be talking to us uh, about the archaeology of Sutton Park. So Mike has Sutton Coldfield uh, in his heart, I think it's fair to say. He grew up in Sutton Coldfield uh, and then he went on to do a degree in ancient history and archaeology at the University of Birmingham. And that was followed by a PhD, uh, let me get the title right, on the development of settlement and land use in Sutton Chase. And Sutton Chase is an area which now encompasses what we know as, as Sutton Park. So, uh, he, you know, he, he is the world expert on uh, uh, Sutton Park archaeology. Now, after his PhD, sadly, he was lured away from Sutton Coldfield and worked for a while uh, uh, at Sandwell Council. And then he was the chief um, archaeologist for Birmingham City Council for 20 odd years. Uh, so he was involved with all the archaeology uh, and archaeological research and digs that were a result of the planning process. So whenever there was a big development in Birmingham, Mike was there with his trowel and hard hat, um, at least metaphorically speaking, although I think actually in reality as well. So for example, he was involved in the archaeological excavations that were linked to or were part of the redevelopment of the Bullring um, and the um, QE hospital. For, um, so he's, he's seen a lot of changes in Birmingham over, over the years. Uh, anyway, as I say, he was lured away by Birmingham for a while, but we're delighted he's here this evening because uh, Sutton really is um, where his archaeological heart is. Uh, he is uh, still very active in Sutton Coalfield, so he's president of FOSPA, which is Friends um, uh, of Sutton Park Association. He's also a member of Sutton Coalfield Local History Research Group, and he, he has many, many more uh, strings to his bow. So uh, I'm really delighted that he's here tonight to talk to us about the archaeology of Sutton Park. And without further ado, I shall uh, hand over to him and he shall start sharing his screen. Um, if there are any issues, please do contact us via the chat. I, I'm going to mute myself and take myself off video, but hopefully uh, any minute now we shall start seeing Mike's slides. Right. Well, as I mentioned in her introduction, I was born in Sutton Coldfield and I've been researching the archaeology of Sutton Park for over 40 years now. And this first picture shows you something of the character of the archaeology in the park. Most of the archaeological sites are visible as earthworks, as banks and ditches, like the medieval boundary that you see on this picture here, this bank and ditch. And on the right here, you can see a couple of characters have been involved in Sutton Park's past, a Roman soldier and Henry VIII, and I'll mention those a little later on. Right, the archaeology of Sutton Park consists of very well-preserved and extensive archaeological remains, and we're still finding even more. The archaeological remains range in date from prehistoric times right up to the 20th century. We have prehistoric burnt mounds, a Roman road, extensive remains of the medieval deer park which existed from the 12th to the 16th century and it's that which has really shaped Sutton Park as we see it today. Also things that happened after the deer park and from the time when Sutton Park has been a public park from the 19th century onwards and used mainly for public recreation we have remains of organised sport and of military training. Nowadays, the emphasis is very much on protection of archaeological remains and interpreting them to visitors. Well, I'm sure you all know exactly where Sutton Park is, um, just on the west side of the town of Sutton Coldfield. And when you visit Sutton Park today, you're visiting what's basically still a medieval landscape. The shape and the extent of Sutton Park correspond almost exactly to the medieval deer park and even the shape of the woods follow medieval subdivisions and the park contains extensive archaeological remains of the deer park and also things that came before it and what followed it. The archaeological remains include very extensive uh, and entire lengths of earthwork boundaries 
like this. You're seeing Keeper's Valley, a bank and ditch forming a subdivision of the medieval deer park. So they're not just individual sites, the whole lengths of boundary earthworks like this. And there are over 250 archaeological sites in the park uh, currently recorded on Birmingham City Council's historic environment record, the City Council's archaeological database. And the red lines and black dots on the map there show all the archaeological sites that have so far been recorded. Although, in fact, there are more to add to that because that's the number of sites that were recorded in 2014. Since, as I mentioned, we found quite a bit more. And the archaeological remains of Sutton Park are nationally important. Most of Sutton Park is designated a scheduled ancient monument. So what does Sutton Park look like? Well, that might seem a fairly obvious question for people who visited the park, but we can get a good view of the topography, the hills and valleys of the park from this image from a LIDAR survey. This is an aerial survey by laser, which actually penetrates the tree cover and the vegetation and picks up the obvious features like the railway and the Roman road, but also picks up details of the hills and valleys. You can see on that the main valleys, Longmore Valley in the west, and the valley feeding Bracebridge Pool and Blackroot Pool in the east there, but also a lot of other smaller valleys feeding into those. And those valleys were particularly important within the medieval deer park, as you'll see in a moment. The soil underlying most of Sutton Park is a pebbly, sandy soil, as you see here. It's very prone to erosion and also to drying out, and also nutrients get washed through the soil, resulting in it being very acid and very poor for agriculture. The woodland of the park is through its north and east sides, it's mainly oak and holly with a number of conifers that have been added to the woodland mainly in the 19th century. Grassland is on the eastern side of the park, the Meadow Platte area, and also right in the centre, the area is now called the Arena Field. The grassland there is a result of them being ploughed up in the Second World War. And on the west of the park is heathland and wetland, particularly in Longmoor Valley the southwest area there. The earliest evidence we have for people being in Sutton Park is back in the Mesolithic period or Middle Stone Age. These were not farmers, but they would live by hunting wild animals, collecting wild food plants. And they were living in the park between about 6,000 and 4,000 BC. And what they left behind them was some of their flint tools. The tools you see on the picture here are an inch or even less across. And they've each been made by chipping small pieces off the edges of flint to shape them and to create sharp edges. These people, these hunters and gatherers, were living in woodland at that time. We know that because pollen survives in peat in the park. Peat is very slowly decaying vegetation. The deepest peat in the park is in Longmoor Valley. And in sampling that and identifying the pollen grains contained within it, uh, they include pollen of Scots pine and a number of deciduous trees, as you see here, birch, oak, elm, and alder. We actually take a sample out of the peat. In this case, it comes to the lowest level, in other words, the oldest part of the peat and identify all the pollen grains by their very distinctive form. Uh, pollen, as you can see on the picture here, is, is particularly distinctive. Um, in addition to that, actual stumps of pine trees were exposed underneath the peat in Longmoor Valley and in the Streetly area. When it was exposed, it was partly burnt away in a fire in 1921. So these hunters were hunters in the woods between about 6,000 and 4,000 BC. At some time after that, all of the trees were cut down, animals were allowed to graze, the trees didn't grow up again, and heathland developed. Heathland is not a natural form of landscape. Heathland is a, a man-made landscape. The next evidence we have for people in the park 
is a little later on in time, we're shifting now into the Bronze Age. And what you can see here in Longmoor Valley, this grass low mound is a burnt mound. It's a mound of heat shattered stones and charcoal. It's on the very edge of wetland there in Longmoor Valley. The, stone, the stones it's composed of are jagged, like the ones you see on the top left here, and so they have a very crazed surface. Burnt mounds, for <laughs> some reason these are jumping on, bear with me. Um, burnt mounds are very numerous um, in the Birmingham area, about 40 have been found so far, and they've been dated to between 1500 and 1000 BC. And they're interpreted as the debris from either heating up the stones to boil water to cook food, or heating up the stones so cold water can be poured on them to produce steam inside a sweat lodge. And they contain burnt stones, heat shatter stones, and fragments of charcoal. Charcoal is the debris from the wood fuel that was used to heat them up. In certain part, we've also found some mounds that are composed of heat shattered stones, but there doesn't appear to be any charcoal in them, and they're in dry locations. They're not in the wet locations like this one, Longmoor Valley, that we'd expect to find burnt mounds in. So they were using some sort of process that didn't require water. These are two of them. One of them is in Darnellhurst. You can see the man there underneath the measuring rod. The measuring rod incidentally is a meter long. You'll, you'll see this on pictures later on. And another one that's exposed on the surface of a path uh, just north of Pool Hollies. And you can see from the detail at the bottom right there that these are both composed of heat shattered stones, crazed surfaces, just like the ones I showed you a moment ago uh, on the burnt mound in Longmoor Valley. Here are six of these mounds, these burnt stone mounds, near Strictly Lane, the northern side of the park, that were excavated in 1926. They were arranged in an arc and excavation showed that they were composed of heat shattered stones. There was no charcoal though. And underneath two of the mounds, there was a small pit. You can still see one of those. This is it. And it's got one of the markers on the archaeological interpretation trails on it. I'll talk about the trail a little later on. Moving on then to the Roman period, we're very fortunate in having within certain park one of the best preserved stretches of Roman road anywhere in the country. I can only think of one example I've seen that's as well preserved as the road in Sutton Park. And here you see a couple of pictures of it. The most prominent part is the bank or agar, and on each side of that are side ditches and quarry pits. It was built in the middle of the first century AD as a military road. It would be used by people like this soldier you see on the top left here to travel between forts at Wall near Litchfield and Metchley in Edgebaston in southwest Birmingham. So what you can see now is the agar, this raised bank of gravel. In some places the actual gravel surface is exposed and you can see it on the top picture here covered over by snow particularly prominent there. And on each side are, on each side are intermittent ditches these are quite uh, narrow, they wouldn't be enough to dig out the material to make the road, but they're marking out ditches, they're marking out the strip along which vegetation had to be cleared to construct the road. Beyond those are quarry pits, which are really remarkable survival out of which the gravel to create the road surface was dug. Underneath the road, we can see the type of soil on which it was built. And that's exactly the same type of soil that's underneath most of certain part now. It's a pebbly sandy soil, as I mentioned earlier on, but also as you can see from this cross section through the soil, the top layer is actually a white or gray color. That's because all the nutrients have been washed out of it, washed down through the soil to a greater depth, resulting in this very acid soil on which the characteristic type of vegetation is heathland. So because that was found underneath the Roman road, we know that was the type of soil in the park in the first century AD. And therefore the Roman road was built through a landscape of heathland 
very much like you see around the Roman road today. As far as we know, no one actually lived in the park in Roman times. There's no evidence, evidence of any farms or houses or anything like that. But we have found a feature on the golf course just next to the Roman road on this top picture. Uh, the Roman road runs through the trees in the background there. And in front of that, you can see a grass bank with a ditch around it. It's actually a bank and ditch surrounding a roughly square area. Um, on the bottom picture, you get some idea of the size of that from the golfers on it. And this is probably either a Roman fortlet, a small fort alongside the road, or a signal station. Both of these types of sites are extremely rare in the West Midlands. They're much better known in the north and west of Britain, which remained under military control throughout the whole of the period of Roman Britain. We've investigated this site through geophysics. I'm sure you've all heard of geophysics from watching Time Team. Uh, one of the methods of geophysics is magnetometry, where we measure the magnetism of the soil. The soil magnetism is different where you have a field in pit or the site of a building or where there's been burning going on. Uh, that slightly raises the soil magnetism. It's a very small amount, but we can detect that difference with the instrument that you can see on the picture here. And you can see the results of that on that perhaps rather fuzzy um, plot there on the left. What you can see, and I'll try using this again, I'm not doing very well with this, <laughs> try using this again. Um, and you can see there the ditch showing very clearly that white line, but you can also um, see the line of the rampart, which is, I hope I can get to, line of the rampart, which is there. And you can see along that these dark blobs, which are, I don't see that picture yet, these dark blobs, which show where timber posts stood. And these are remains of a fence or a palisade. That's exactly what we'd expect. But just to the right of that, what we didn't expect, you can see these curving lines, sort of joined up C shapes. We'd expected the remains of either a timber tower or perhaps a barrack block inside, but that clearly isn't anything like that. So this might be something that was on the site before the signal station was built or something that happened on the site afterwards. Well, let's move on then to the Middle Ages the 12th century medieval deer park. A deer park was created in Sutton in the 12th century by Henry I. In 1126, it was given to the Earls of Warwick. And it's the creation of the deer park that's really shaped Sutton Park as you can see it today. You can still see the original boundary ditch of the medieval deer park around the western side of Sutton Park around, along Thornhill Road on Strictly Lane on the north and on Chester Road North on the southwest. See the boundary ditch on the top right here. The boundary consists of a ditch with a bank on the outside and a fence on the bank, a rather more substantial fence than the, the park boundary fence today. The purpose of this was to keep in deer. The type of deer that were kept in the park were fallow deer, which you can see at the bottom there. Now, as well as deer, the park also contained fish ponds, three of the pools in certain park, all the pools in the park are man-made, three of them were constructed as fish ponds within the medieval deer park. Those are Keeper's Pool, Windley Pool and Bracebridge Pool. Deer like a mixture of open ground and woodland, the woodland would be wood pasture, and some of the trees in that were pollarded. In other words, they were cut off just above browsing height. You can see some old pollarded trees, but they're not quite as old as the deer park in Gumslade now. The reason there's so much holly in the park is because it was deliberately managed, deliberately encouraged within the deer park. It provided very important winter feed for the deer there. As you can see from this picture, the ponies in the park now find the um, Holly particularly tasty and, and they eat leaves off the trees during the winter. But in the medieval deer park, the holly will be cut and fed to the deer. A deer park was a medieval status symbol. 
And as I mentioned, Sutton Park was a, originally constructed as a royal deer park, constructed by Henry I. It's very large. The medieval deer park was about a thousand hectares, and that's equivalent in size to other royal deer parks like Woodstock in Oxfordshire, where Blenheim Palace is now, and uh, at uh, Windsor in Berkshire. The park, as it was created in the Middle Ages, was slightly larger than we see now. The original boundary of the park on the north, west and southwest is still the boundary of the present park. So, as I mentioned, you can see the present park boundary, the medieval park boundary ditch constructed in the 12th century along Strutley Lane, Thornhill Road and Chester Road North. But on the other side of the park, its extent has been modified later on. So on the south side, the park originally extended beyond Monmouth Drive, but land was taken out of the park there in the 16th century. On the east side, particularly the northeast side, land was taken out later on. The area that's now Four Oaks Estate was all originally part of Sutton Park, and that was taken out of the park in the 18th and 19th centuries. The park originally extended right up to the town centre, right up to High Street, which you can see on the top picture there. It wasn't, of course, a public park in the Middle Ages. It was the private park of the Lords of the Manor. The Manor House on Manor Hill, just up the hill from uh, Winley Pool, is where the Earls of Warwick, who were Lords of the Manor, stayed when they were hunting deer in Sutton Park. As well as the outer boundary ditch and bank, which you can still see today on the on Strictly Lane, Thornhill Road and Chester Road North, subdivisions were created in the park, which are indicated on the, the bottom map there. Um, if I move my mouse, it seems to change the picture, uh, which indicates on the bottom picture there. And these subdivisions were centred on the manor house and they were created to help the process of hunting. They're actually used during the hunting process. All of these subdivisions were bounded by a bank and ditch. The entire extent of those still survives. Here you can see a bank and ditch running across Lower Nuthurst, and another one in Keeper's Valley. Now, of course, the banks and ditches we see now wouldn't have acted as very much of a boundary. You can easily walk over those. Deer could have climbed over those as well. So they must have had something on the top. We thought they might have had a fence, but when we excavated one of these in Keepers Valley, we found no traces of that. So it probably had a dead hedge on top of it. A dead hedge was composed of a mass of cut branches, other cut material piled up on top which provides a very good and stock-proof and deer-proof boundary. The advantage of a dead hedge is it's very quick and easy to put up and equally quick and easy to take away again. And these subdivisions would only have been required when hunting was actually taking place because the deer were kept in the rest of the park by that ditch that you saw around the outer boundary. So how do people actually hunt deer in Sutton Park? Well, they certainly didn't chase all over the park hoping to find a deer and kill it. It was far more organised than that. And it made the most of the fact that the park was deliberately laid out to include a number of stream valleys, which we saw in a picture earlier on. The deer were actually chased by beaters, the beaters and their dogs indeed, down valleys, down the valleys you can see on the LIDAR image on the right there, valleys like Keeper's Valley, you see the picture on the top, and into these subdivisions. That would contain them in a smaller area. Then they were driven past archers who were standing on platforms who would shoot the deer. And here you can see an archer's platform in Hollyhurst, not far from Keeper's Pool, where an archer would have stood to shoot deer that were being driven down Keeper's Valley. I mentioned earlier on that deer parks were very much a status symbol, as were the deer that were kept in them, because in the Middle Ages, you couldn't just buy venison like we buy today. Venison was owned, it was given to you, or it was poached and it was stolen. You couldn't just buy it. It was very much a status meat. 
So these beaters would have had a base probably in Hollyhurst where there's a small rectangular area at the highest point of Hollyhurst. You see on the picture on the left there, this is actually a small rectangular area surrounded by a bank and ditch. And the highest point of Hollyhurst, it's at a point that on 19th century maps is called the centre of England. And this is near a glade. It's a path that runs across the middle of Hollyhurst through Keeper's Valley, over Keeper's Pool, and through Lower Nutthurst, which ran, runs from one side of the division, one side of the subdivision, to the other. In the centre of the park is the Park Keeper's Lodge, or the site of the Park Keeper's Lodge. This is a roughly square area surrounded by a bank and ditch. You can see that on the top pitch where it's brought out by the shadows of trees there it's in, as you can see, woodland now originally would have been in completely open ground. And on the bottom pitch, you get some idea of the size of that, roughly square area surrounded by a ditch and a very slight bank. At one corner of this are animal burrows and in the burrows, in the spoil from the burrows, you can see medieval roof tile. So it indicates we do actually have a tiled building there. The roof tile we can't date particularly closely, but we know that people are using tile on roofs in this area from the middle of the 13th century onwards. So it gives us a, a bit of a starting date. And the park went out of use in the 16th century, so the lodge wouldn't have been occupied any time after that. It would have been occupied by the park keeper, the equivalent of the head ranger in the park now, um, and his family. We've investigated this site too by magnetometry. As you saw from the previous pictures, you can't see anything on the ground surface. Now we've got a clue about the type of buildings there uh, from the roof tile. And here you see the magnetometry in progress and the image on the top there shows you what we found. You can see these dark lines uh, the dark lines running at right angles to each other there, which are like to be the footprint of a building. It would have been a timber frame building, possibly resting on a low stone wall to keep the timbers off the ground surface, where, of course, they'd rot. To give you some idea of the size of that building, on the bottom picture there, you can see uh, one of the archaeologists who did the survey, and the building would have extended from where she's standing up to the larger tree um, just on the left of the picture and to the stump you can just see in the foreground. It's about 10 metres long, perhaps eight metres across. And the lodge is right in the centre of the park, as you can see from the uh, picture from the map at the bottom there. It's very close to the original main road through the park. The original main route through the park from the manor house because bear in mind the park was centred on and used by the manor house, it wasn't centred on the town. Uh, the original main route went from the manor house alongside Winley Pool up through the middle of Hollyhurst and then followed a line that's pretty much followed by the tarmac road that goes from Keeper's Pool then out uh, past the Jambree Stone and out at Streetly Gate. The Lodge site is very close to another subdivision of the park. This subdivision is bounded like the others by a bank and ditch. You can see two parts of that. And it seems to have been designed to enclose all of the woodland of the park and the two main stream valleys. The stream, uh, the Longmoor Brook Valley, which now feeds Longmoor Pool, and the valley of the stream feeding Bracebridge and Blackroot Pools. And in addition to that, all the woodland, because all of the, the edge of the woodland now is almost exactly determined by the line of this boundary. You can see on the top left there, past this bank and ditch uh, near, Darn near Darnellhurst. And at the bottom, the continuation of the bank and ditch across what's now the golf course, not far from the Jamboree Stone. The deer park was created in the 12th century, went out of use in the 16th century, or perhaps more correctly, it was put out of use in the 16th century. By that time, 
Sutton Coldfield and Sutton Park were under royal ownership. And through the instigation of Bishop Vesey, uh, a local chap, uh, very well known, I think, to most people in Sutton Coldfield, um, Henry VIII granted Sutton Coldfield a royal charter. And this included giving Sutton Park to the newly created governing body of Sutton Coldfield uh, called the Warden and Society. Local people were allowed to graze their animals in the park and collect wood from it. The woodland was managed in a rather different way from the way to be managed in the deer park. It was managed as coppice. The trees were cut down and shoots would grow from the stump and those shoots could be harvested as a, a renewable resource. But those, the young shoots growing from the stumps are very palatable to grazing animals. So it's very important to keep grazing animals out of that woodland, otherwise they just eat the wood up. Um, so the, the woodland areas were each individually surrounded by a boundary consisting of bank and ditch with a fence as well. The ditch being on the outside of the bank in contrast to the boundaries in the deer park, which were intended to keep animals in, had a ditch on the inside of the bank. And the entire circuits of these bank and ditch boundaries, but around the woodland in Sutton Park, still survive. You can trace the whole of these around Darnellhurst, Streetly Wood, Upper and Lower Nutters, Pool Hollies, Hollyhurst, around all of these woodland areas. In some cases, these boundaries follow earlier medieval boundaries. At Hollyhurst, you can see on the bottom here, there's a ditch on the inside of the bank as well as the the outside because it actually runs along an earlier medieval boundary. So the medieval boundary had a ditch on the inside. Here you can see a ditch on the inside and the outside. The outside ditch was constructed in the 16th century. Within the woods, there are over a hundred saw pits, like the pits you see on the picture here. They're oval pits with a bank on one side. Most of these were found by Roy Billingham, a local researcher. And the saw pits were designed so that you'd lay a piece of wood across them to cut it up into smaller pieces. The man doing the sawing would actually stand inside the pit. The piece of uh, timber would be laid across from one edge of the pit to the other. The woods were individually enclosed to keep out animals, but also glades were provided between the woodland areas. The cattle that were being pastured in the park by local people would have been driven from the eastern side of the park, the town side of the park, into the open part of the park on the west, so they had to go through the woodland. But to avoid them having to go right through the middle of the woodland, these glades were provided, which are droveways, had a bank and ditch on each side to keep cattle out of the woods. These include Stony Glade between Darnellhurst and Upper Nutter. You can see the boundary banks on each side there. Blackroot Glade between Upper and Lower Nuthurst. That's the um, steep slope that runs up slope from Blackroot Pool. And Windley Glade, which goes through Hollyhurst. As I mentioned, you can trace the boundary banks and ditches that were constructed in the 16th century around the woods for their entirety, you can see it's the whole circuit of these. In some cases, though, the boundary of the woodland no longer corresponds to that bank and ditch, as is the case for Streetly Wood. This is an extract from a map of 1779. I know the lettering's upside down, that's because north is actually at the, is, is shown on the one side of the map. So I'll put it so north is at the top, which as you might expect. You can see Streetly Wood circled there. It doesn't appear to have a boundary shown it on, the, on that map. In other words, the boundary had gone out of use by 1779. But on the edge of the golf course, you can see part of its southern boundary. Its northern boundary, you can see very clearly just the north of the road from Streetly Gate. The southern boundary, you can see on the edge of the golf course on the bottom picture. And within the golf course, with later woodland spread over it, you can see another part of that boundary, that moss covered bank you can see, is the boundary bank of Streetly Wood that was constructed in the 16th century. Also in the 16th century, the waters of the park were first used 
to power water mills. The earliest water mill in Sutton Park was Blaise Mill. The site of that is now occupied by Park House, where you can still see some 18th century buildings of Blaise Mill just to the left there, just to the left of the pub and restaurant. The mill was powered by a pool, which is the only one of Sutton Park's pools to now be dry. That's the site of Blade Mill Pool. It's not very far from the Donkey Sanctuary. From that, a head race or water channel ran to or towards the mill at Blade Mill. Other pools were constructed in the 18th century to drive water mills. They included Powell's Pool with a very substantial dam, which you see as you're going up towards Boldmere Gate, Blackroot Pool and Longmoor Pool. The use of Sutton Park as a public park really began or developed in the 19th century. People used the park as we do now, just for informal recreation, but also there were organised sports in the park as well. They included horse racing. There was a race course near Westwood Coppice in the southwest of the park and another one on Holly Knoll. And for the one on Holly Knoll, you can still see the spectator bank, which you can see in the picture here, people stood or sat on the spectator bank. It was the usual sort of oval uh, Porsche racing course. The first golf course constructed in the park was near Meadow Platt. And you can see uh, part of that still opposite the visitor center, you can see what was a golf course bunker. You can see that pit on the picture there. There was also hunting in Sutton Park. In the 18th century, hunting with dogs took place, fox hunting. But also there was a, a wildfowl shooting. Here at Little Bracebridge Pool, just on one side of the pool, you can see some hollows, which were probably constructed as duck decoys. Wildfowl would be enticed into these and shot by people in a hide at the end of the hollow. In the 19th and 20th centuries, Sutton Park was used for military training. Perhaps some of the most prominent remains of this are in Longmoor Valley, where there was a military rifle range in the 19th century, and you can still see a concrete line target there, a concrete line trench there, which formed parts of targets. The trench was to shelter soldiers who were manning the targets set up just behind them and that mound of earth behind was designed to catch stray shot. Soldiers training in Sutton Park in the 19th century stayed in a camp of bell tents, and you can still see the circular gullies that were dug around those trenches as drip trenches to drain them. The park was also used for military training in the, in the First World War, when soldiers dug practice trenches, you can see some of them digging practice trenches in the park on the left there. As you can see, they were angled trenches and they weren't necessarily dug to full depth or full width because the object of the exercise was to teach soldiers how to lay out trenches. And you can see the remains of these near Bracebridge Pool, you can see that very shallow angular um, ditch there, a shallow and narrow ditch because it not only was it dug to not the full depth or full width, but also would have been filled in after the training took place. You can see rather deeper trenches in Longmoor Valley. You can see how, there how the shadow picks out a, a zigzag trench. And on the top there in Streetly Wood, this is a site we only found a couple of years ago. Uh, again, you can see how the snow is picking out that zigzag line. Um, I don't think we'd have seen it were it not, not for this slight snow cover. So military training was quite extensive over the park in the First World War. And the Second World War, as well as training taking place, there was an American army camp on the north side of the park near Streetly Lane. The remains of some of the buildings of those were very clearly visible this summer where the grass had actually parched out along the lines. You can see arrowed on that top picture of the wall lines of the buildings within that camp. And also on the left there, a slag built roadway leading up to the camp from the Streetly Lane. Near to it, 
was an anti-aircraft gun sight. On the bottom there, you can see, I hope, the circular bank that surrounded the anti-aircraft gun installation. Now, as I mentioned, the emphasis is very much on the protection of certain parks archaeology and the interpretation of the archaeology to visitors. Protection of the parks archaeology is extremely important because, as you can see here, archaeological remains are irreplaceable. They're vulnerable to permanent damage. Much of the park, uh, the archaeological sites in most of the park are legally protected as a scheduled ancient monument. And it's a criminal offence to damage the archaeological sites in any way. It's also a criminal offence to use a meth detector. And it's very important that any works undertaken in the park, such as tree works, for example, are undertaken in ways that don't damage the archaeological remains because the archaeological remains are irreplaceable. And there are pressures through erosion by cycles, particularly off-road cycling and vehicles, and pressures caused by holding large sports events and entertainments. And I think quite a problem is the way people perceive the park. The park is sometimes seen as yet another public park, just, to, just another public park like the rest of the public parks in Birmingham. And there's a bit of a lack of appreciation sometimes of its significance as a very special place and a very special landscape. Well, I've been talking about the archaeology of certain park, the ecology of certain park is of course also nationally important and the ecology and archaeology of the park are interrelated. Interpretation of the archaeological remains, explain them to visitors, include self-guided trails called Walking Through Time, which were set up by FOSPA, the Friends of Sutton Park Association and the Sutton Coalfield Civic Society, and guided walks, uh, which FOSPA have done uh, for several years now, um, unfortunately not been able to do over the past few months, but hopefully we will be able to resume those at some time in the future. And at the same time, further investigation continues, further research to find out more about the park's past. Well, despite all the restrictions, despite us not being able to do actual guided walks now, you can still follow these trails yourself, these self-guided walk routes on uh, walking through time. Walking through time consists of panels at some of the gates and at other places, including Blackroot Bistro and markers on individual sites. If you want to read more about the archaeology of Sutton Park, uh, there's a book I published a few years ago, which is shortly going to be reprinted, a slightly updated version. And there's also my book on the archaeology of Birmingham as a whole, Birmingham the Hidden History, so do look out for these. And also uh, there's a forthcoming article in the British Archaeology magazine um, about recent discoveries in the park. And just a reminder, finally, that Sutton Park is open every day. Do visit it, do go and have a look at these sites. Thank you.